Let's, um, thank you. Let's move on to the our panel and uh, get some more input. Uh, what I'll do is introduce each panel member and kind of one at a time and, and ask them to give a brief reflection on uh, Dr. Sunderland's presentation, as well as provide their own knowledge from, from their own work to, on this topic. I'll start with Bruce Alexander. Uh, Bruce is the professor and head of the Department of Environmental and Radi Radiological Health Sciences at Colorado State University. He's an occupational environmental epidemiologist with research interest in environmental determinants of cancer and respiratory disease, injury prevention and control, One Health, the health of agricultural populations and global health. In relation to PFAS, He's conducted studies of mortality and cancer incidents in two groups of workers employed at PFAS manufacturing facilities. He also served as an advisor to the Minnesota Department of Health on their biomonitoring program, which included monitoring of community exposure to PFAS. So Dr. Alexander, would you like to uh, give a brief uh, reflection? Yeah, I would. And I, I thought Dr. Sunderland just gave a very excellent overview of what is an, a really complex causal exposure web for, for these chemicals. And the, I like that she identified that you, we have the kind of the exposed communities that have at least one identifiable um, source of exposure. And then you have a general population and trying to understand that exposure in the general population and is, is really complicated or very complex. Um, and that, you know, and as it, as it feeds into what the charge for this committee is, is what do you do with that information to, um, to an, inform, inform providers and the public about, you know, monitoring health in, in relation to those, those potential exposures. You know, and I also think that some of the things she pointed out on the, for example, the um, potential source of, uh, of food as a, as a con contributor to the overall exposure is 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 a is a good example of that really not fully understanding and I agree that the statement from the FDA acting um, director was uh, really kind of off the mark and and not you know and taking a small amount of, of information and and extrapolating beyond it but I think it does beg the question of what are potential routes of exposure and are they you know the other question is are they relevant for health but just what is what are potential exposures so I think. I think that was a very nice overview of, of the complexity of this problem. And um, that also, I think, is an example of where, for example, uh, the, Ms. Amigo, she identified the lack of information for the public and lack of information for providers to make decisions is, is, is rooted in, in a lot of the uncertainty that, that, that we're dealing with. And so, um, so I think the um, I think that's um, that's that set the stage for for this panel to you know I re recognize you really have a, a tough job ahead of you, um, but I and but when there are specific areas of, of of known exposure, I think where the bio monitoring comes in, and which is incredibly important for exposed communities, is having a, a process where it can be routinely done. To monitor the progress of, of elimination of these sources of exposure, and so and that, that's an example we we had a good example of that in Minnesota with a a, a community that had been highly exposed and with and following the um, the intervention of you know, we could really track that yes that it was in fact um, working but there were also a few concerns that maybe there are some other sources of exposure that hadn't been identified. So maybe Chris, I'll just leave it there and let other folks uh, chime in. But I do do really appreciate the insights that uh, uh, Dr. Sunderland gave. Great, thank you. Next on the panel, uh, Thomas Webster, Boston University School of Public Health. Dr. Webster has several main research areas: uh, exposure routes and health hazards of chemicals used in consumer products, especially flame retardants, plasticizers, and emerging compounds as well as perfluoroalkyl compounds uh, that are also found in water. Uh, other areas are health impacts of exposure to mixtures of chemicals with applications in toxicology and epidemiology and endocrine disruption, methodological aspects of environmental epidemiology, particularly causal inference 
ecologic bias, the use of combinations of individuals and group level data, and disease mapping and clusters. Uh, Dr. Webster served on the National Research Council Subcommittee on Fluoride and Drinking Water and the Institute of Medicine's Committee on Making Best Use of the Agent Orange Exposure Reconstruction Model. So, Dr. Webster. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Dr. Sentlin, for your nice overview. I know we've, we've had several long conversations recently talking about this. So I wanted to make uh, just a, a few points. Um, I think the the first is really about interventions that I really think of it is there's two kinds of interventions we can think about. Um, and that we have kind of an ongoing problem where the uh, um, th there's really been a shift in the PFASs that are being produced and released into the environment and um, towards newer ones. And they're not necessarily better. And I personally feel we're just kicking the can down the road and working, you know, making work for our students. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to think about that. The second is this sort of legacy stuff that's already out there. And what do we do about that? So, for example, the stuff that came out of um, AFFF and is in the water supplies. Um, going along with the interventions, there's really sort of two two other two time courses. One is fast responders. So I think uh, food packaging should respond should respond fairly quickly. But other things that are persistent and mobile in environment are uh, going to be around for a long time. Um, okay. Second point is um, about the gap between the sort of extractable organofluorine we find in environmental samples, including human serum and targeted PFAS. And uh, this is something that uh, Dr. Sendlin mentioned. Uh, my group has been doing work on this lately with human serum from the United States. And like in other places, uh, we find a very substantial amount of unexplained organofluorine. And I personally think that this gap is one of the most important scientific questions we have to answer is what, what is that stuff? So stay tuned. We're working on that, and there are a lot of people working on that. Um, the third, uh, just comment a little bit briefly on the um, exposure routes. Um, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with uh, Elsie on what she said. Uh, let me just echo a couple more things that I, I do think that there is some reasonably good work now on the importance of indoor uh, exposure to uh, volatile precursors such as fluorotelomer alcohols and how they, they're used in consumer products and then they off, they off gas and you breathe them in and that they contribute to the uh, serum uh, body burden. Um, the second is that um, I, I also agree that we really need total exposure studies in the United States. The problem is they're very difficult to get funded. Um, NIH really has no mechanism to do this because it's an exposure study. It's not health per se. So there really, there's no study section. There's really no way to do it. Um, there is an RFA from the, from the Environmental Protection Agency right now to do this, but it's, it's way underfunded. I mean, it's just not enough money to really do it right. So this is a big, something that I would hope the Academy could weigh in on. Um, the third uh, part, really, I wanna talk about a little bit more about diet. This is something that I've done work on and there, there's clearly good evidence that at least in the past, diet was a very substantial contributor to human exposure. This gets to uh, the question Jane mentioned about, you know, um, uh, half-lives and all that, uh, but, you know, it's possible um, that there's really been sort of a, a shift in what we're exposed to. For example, uh, I, people want to ask me, I can talk more about the FDA. They didn't mention, they didn't, they measured more traditional PFASs mostly. They didn't look a lot at a lot of the potential precursors that might be used in food packaging. So we might just be measuring the wrong thing for what's out there now, because this study was very recent. Um, I did talk to someone in the European, uh, connect with the European Food Safety Authority uh, yesterday, and they, they echoed that they thought the detection limits might be too high to look for some things, because I was also surprised that we didn't see more fish popping up anyway, because that would be exposure to some of the more persistent compounds like PFOS. So um, I, I don't think, you know, I think the FDA, uh, they, you know, they did a good screening study. I don't think it really answers the question of how important 
PFAS exposures through diet for the general population. To do that, we're gonna to have to work harder. So let me stop. Okay, thank you. And uh, third on our, our panel is Dr. Laurel Shader with the Silent Spring Institute. Dr. Shader is a research scientist in environmental chemistry and engineering at the Silent Spring Institute, where she leads the Institute's water quality research on PFAS and other contaminants of emerging concern. Her research focuses on characterizing PFAS exposures from drinking water, diet, and consumer products, understanding health effects associated with PFAS, investigating socioeconomic disparities and exposure to drinking water contaminants, and working with communities to develop research studies and resources to address their concerns. Dr. Shader is the principal investigator for the PFAS REACH, uh, which is Research, Education, and Action for Community Health Study. Uh, Dr. Shader. Hey, great. Thanks so much. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I thought Elsie's presentation did a really nice job of laying out what we know and what we don't know about the relative importance of various sources of PFAS exposure. And I thought it also highlighted some of the challenges that we might have as we try to think about how we translate this knowledge into information for residents of PFAS impacted communities and for physicians. Um, so in thinking about a few comments to make, I went back to the committee's charge um, and thinking about developing principles that clinicians can use in advising patients about exposure reduction. Um, so I, I thought of a few to share. Um, one is that providing information to patients about how to reduce PFAS exposures, especially among highly exposed people, is important um, for a couple of reasons. It, um, you know, for people who've had high exposures, there's really not much that can be done to um, accelerate their um, body's um, excretion of those PFAS compounds. Um, but it is important to make sure that they minimize any new exposures moving forward to help their serum levels go down and to minimize any additional cumulative health impacts. Um, and it's also important because it's something that people can act on and, and do. Um, they can't change their past exposures, but they can um, have some, some control over their exposures moving forward. Um, and there are some evidence-based tips that can be shared, as, as LC showed in her um, last slide or second to last slide, we still don't know um, the relative contributions of diet versus um, consumer products in the general population, um, but there are some evidence-based tips that can be shared. Um, some might be specific to a local community, so avoiding local fish from contaminated water bodies or filtering drinking water, um, or some that might be applicable to the general population, so avoiding stain-resistant carpets or microwave popcorn. Um, that being said, there are, of course, important gaps in identifying which of these are most important and which, you know, which one to focus on. We really don't know at this point which are the, you know, the most important tips to share. Um, and as Tom said, these types of studies are, are rarely or poorly funded. Um, it can be difficult to identify the main sources of exposure, and we know that these would vary from person to person and community to community. Um, I also wanted to think about when, when physicians might be talking with patients about this type of information. I also think in terms of general principles, it's important for patients not to be made to feel like the, their exposures are their own fault. Um, you know, their cumulative exposures are mostly going to be driven by past exposures that they weren't aware of and were out of their control. So it's sort of important to find a, a balance between framing this exposure reduction as something that can be done, um, but not making them feel like it's, it's their fault that they've had this exposure. Um, I think we also need to keep in mind environmental justice concerns. Um, not everyone has the same ability to take steps to reduce their exposures, and so it's important not to exacerbate disparities. Um, so for instance, some exposure reduction tips might be difficult for economically disadvantaged people to implement. So renters might not be able to change out their carpets or buy new furniture. Um, subsistence fishers might rely on their local environment as a source of dietary protein. Uh, and not all people can afford water filtration. So it's important to, to keep that in mind and to think about um, community level interventions as well as um, these kind of individual interventions. Um, and then the last point I wanted to make was just that these exposure reduction tips should be in addition to and not instead of guidance on medical screening or finding ways to incorporate um, information about past exposures into individuals' health histories. So I'll wrap it up there and pass it back to you, Chris, thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, time for questions. And while uh, while the committee is thinking of questions, I, I'd like to 
try to put two pieces together here with the expertise we've got in our panel. Uh, talked a lot about potential exposure, a lot about the potential body burden sources of exposure. How do you how do you link exposure risk with disease risk? So that back to clinical guidance, so that you give the, the clinical guidance that's appropriate that it's not merely the presence of the PFAS materials. I think we've pretty much decided that's gonna be universal, but it's at what point uh, does it present a risk? And that's gonna be obviously different with different populations. Uh, but I'd, I'd be interested in anyone that'd like to reflect on, on uh, kind of making that linkage between exposure and, and effect uh, based on what we know or don't know at this point. Um, this is Tom. I mean, I, I'm, you know, also an environmental epidemiologist. So this is, we, we do this all the time. Uh, for PFAS, we typically use um, serum biomonitoring as our measure of exposure and then relate it to health outcomes. So there's lots and lots of studies that have been done on this in the last 10 years or so. Um, it, it, there is a, sort of an interesting question that sometimes it turns out to be better um, methodologically to use an external measure of exposure, but that's sort of a fine point. So, uh, but you know, that's what we do is to try to look at the association between say mixtures of PFAS we find in serum and, and health outcomes uh, controlling for, you know, confounders and stuff like that. So that's the general framework. Other thoughts? Questions from oh, Bruce? I'll, I'll just jump in on that. I think also, you know, and, and there are there are always challenges uh, with these these studies, and in the end, we have fairly blunt tools to uh, to identify the the health effects from these these fairly ubiquitous exposures, particularly at the lower levels. And there has been a lot of research, and I think that's why you see a lot of. Um, uncertainty around the health effects because you know it causes everything and nothing it seems it, 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 it is, is one kind of way to look at it. it's, it's very frustrating that there's a lot of inconsistency in the in in the results and so i think that leads to the some of the anxiety around these chemicals is you know really not having clear answers on on what it on what um the health effects are that people can really say with certainty and i think that's you know to the the charge for this committee that is you know it's obviously a very uh difficult difficult thing to get your head around and so the other side of that is say well is it enough to know that we have a major source of exposure and then focus on reducing that rather than trying to um uh it you know before we ever maybe a long time before we can really figure out the exact health effects Uh, Xiaoming, question? Yeah. Um, first, thank you so much for uh, Elsie and, and the panel have provided such uh, informative uh, information. So I have a, a question uh, I'd like uh, Elsie to further elaborate is, um, so you mentioned a toddler and young children uh, tend to have a highest exposure. Um, I just wondering, um, where the potential sources for those. It could be um, transplacental or breastfeeding or postnatal or uh, dietary uh, or environment. So, so I just wonder whether you can elaborate a little bit. Yeah, well, we, we know that breastfeeding is an important route of exposure for young children. And you can think about the half-life of different PFAS so that the you know, the duration of breastfeeding does correlate with the body burden that you see in children. Um, and then children have smaller bodies. So if they're eating foods with the same concentrations, they're going to be receiving a relatively higher proportional uh, burden from those foods. Um, but the early life exposure is uh, largely a maternal transfer is my understanding. Do you wanna to comment Tom? I was going to say, I, I don't think we know it as well for PFAS, but we've established um, for a lot of other compounds that young children can be exposed through, through dust, uh, 
because they get it on their hands and they're always sticking their hands in their mouth. And so uh, while I'm a little more dubious about dust exposure for adults, I think it's a, it's for real for, for little kids. So I think that's probably yeah. important. Too. That's a good point. So we did a study of uh, young children in the Faroe Islands and you see a correlation between certain types of PFAS that would be associated with hand to mouth contact and carpets and things like that that you don't see in the adults. So they have a very specific composition. So this is actually slightly older. So very young children, I think you see the maternal body burden. And once you get to ages five through 11, then you start to see some different, different exposures than adults as well. Although they shouldn't be crawling on the carpet quite as much at those ages, right? Alex, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I, I do actually. You, you. Um, first of all, thank you for the uh, presentation, and I'll say I just wanted to sort of dig in a little bit uh, more into what you said. And I'm going to put my hat on, uh, not as a somebody who's interested in public health, but as a um, general pediatrician. So my first question is: Do you, in in your work, have you ever looked at cord blood, and then babies who are breastfed to see if it's really the the breastfeeding that's causing the exposure, or would you? Would you, is cord blood a good enough sample to find out what the um, neonates exposure was prenatally? So I, I guess I should clarify my expertise is environment up to exposure and I am not an epidemiologist. I collaborate okay. closely with a colleague, uh, Philippe Grangen, who's done uh, exactly this kind of study. Um, and so there is there is a control for, you know, there's the maternal measurement, the cord blood measurement, and then over the duration of breastfeeding. And there are a number of th these findings have now been duplicated across different cohorts um, as well, showing, you know, the relative contribution of breastfeeding. Um, so I guess, children. Yeah. My, you know, my, my question is what I was trying to sort of dig this out then is, you know, do you think that, um, uh, women, new mothers um, uh, should breastfeed their children if they've been exposed to, to PFAS? Would you recommend that they um, not breastfeed? And, and if that's the case, what's the, the relative benefit and harm of making that kind of recommendation around breastfeeding? Yeah, I think that that's unfortunately the, uh, an extremely challenging question that I would consider beyond my my expertise, so maybe I'll punt that to Tom, uh, <laughs> representative epidemiologist. I mean, what, what I've heard my colleague, the only thing I can say is what I've heard my colleagues say is it, it's, it's always better to breastfeed and there's no contradiction in that advice at this time. Um, there's also evidence for, and I'm gonna pass it to you, Tom, in just a second, but there is also evidence for the duration of breastfeeding being limited um, by the body burden of PFAS. So for women that have high exposure burdens um, because it, it interferes with fat metabolism, um, there, you, you know, there, there's a, a direct correlation between how long some women appear to be able to breastfeed and the, the, their exposure. So I think you know, that there is that complexity as well. Um, I think going back to what Laurel was saying earlier, this is just such a charged issue and it's so important to make sure the women you know, and the, the mothers don't feel responsible for this or any blame for this. And I think, you know, I, again, that's why I say this is this is well beyond my right. Yeah, but I'm just trying to imagine, you know, because there's there's this push for for screening, like what I'm going to do as a as a as a general pediatrician. So, you know, not not breastfeeding can carry harm with it, or maybe they're going to mix the formula up now and they're going to have yep. to use water from somewhere, right? So that could be bad. Or if I'm gonna all of a sudden tell a family that, well, you know, there, there's lots of peepots around, so don't let your baby crawl on the ground, is is uh, not not going to be a particularly helpful recommendation. So again, I'm just I'm just struggling trying to figure out that this balance of benefit and harm around um, uh, testing when there's a baby involved. Uh, since I got asked, uh, uh, you know, this is not a question epidemiologists can really answer. But I will tell you one thing is that. Um, I, uh, I and a bunch of my colleagues have looked a lot at um, PFAX exposure to uh, infants in, in utero and early life and uh, potential neurotoxicity. I don't think there's very good evidence for that, for this group of compounds. There's plenty of other things to worry about for PFAS, but, but not that. Yeah. 
Other questions from the committee? They're all be quiet. Hey, Chris. Yes. Go ahead, Ned. So, so you know, <laughs> you know, um, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll be looking for a simple answer. <laughs> it, it's hard to uh, it's hard to implement a complex solution, um, and there may not be a simple solution. But <clears throat> you know, I was thinking about environmental exposures, like near the Pueblo Army Depot here in Colorado, where they they store mustard gas and do things with it to try to destroy it. <clears throat> Nearby is the very small town my mom was born in, Boone, Colorado. And Boone has a large, a, a greater than expected percentage of people who have lung cancer. <clears throat> On the other hand, the residents of Boone all smoke cigarettes. <clears throat> and so when we start looking at issues around lung cancer, you say, well, if you're smoking and you're expo and you live near the Army Depot, it's the it's the cigarette that causes your lung cancer, and and, and so that's kind of the answer that uh, is a framework that helps us. And so, as I, I listen to your issue and I think about PFOS exposure, I think if it's in the drinking water, that seems like a logical ma major source. And if it's and, and then I get the food issue too. The whole bioconcentration in seafood, which is, you know, personally quite distressing to a landlocked seafood lover, uh, and then the cow's milk that, and, and, uh, and other agro products. I think if you don't have it in the drinking water, or sorry, if you do have it in the drinking water, that becomes another additional major source, right? Because the, the cows and the, and, the, and the fish and the sea and the shellfish are all in the water. But so I'm thinking about when we're thinking about major exposures, dust aside, which I'm still wrestling with, if we know it's in the drinking water, does that provide a more uh, a framework for thinking about where the major sources are? Yes, I mean I think that's what we did, we we know with confidence, and why the emphasis on remediating drinking water supplies has has taken place. And I think what the point I was trying to make in my presentation is, okay, what, you know, what do we call high? So if you know that concentrations are above 70 nanograms per liter, that's probably going to be a really the dominant source. Once we start getting into the one to 10 nanogram per liter range, it's likely that you're going to have other sources that will rival in magnitude that water exposure. So if you're providing advice to an individual to reduce exposure, um, you, you may want to have a multifaceted approach. And I don't think that there's any harm in a precautionary approach targeted at consumer products or some of these various things where we don't know the magnitude of exposure, but you can easily provide advice saying try to minimize, you know, get with the caveat of these, you know, environmental justice concerns. I think that, that, that that's reasonable advice. Um, my own feeling on this issue is that the responsibility is really the chemical manufacturers and what we should be targeting is removing these compounds uh, from our supply chains and we should be removing them and remediating the environmental systems and the water supplies and that should be the focus. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a punt and shift to say like to, to individuals who are exposed, what should they do? Um, you know, they can do these things where we're targeting these sources. Um, they can, you know, they can have the filtered water. But I also think just, just from a societal standpoint, we have a responsibility to talk about this issue and place the burden where it originated as well. If, if I could echo that, um, I mean, I, I think of this, it's like the hydra problem. You cut off one head and two more grow back. And that's what we're having with, with PFAS and a lot of other things. And I think basically the only real solution is to stop making persistent mobile compounds because some of them are going to turn out to be bad. I would, I would agree with everything that Elsie and Tom just said and specifically to your question that I know in the New Jersey drinking water um, 
documents where they developed their PFOS and PFOA guidelines. They evaluated at what point and at what water concentration water became the dominant source of exposure. I have to go back and get the exact numbers, but I believe it was somewhere in the range of 20 to 40 parts per chillion. Um, I'd be happy to look that up for you. Um, so that provides some guidance, I think, about at what about what point and what water concentration you know we think water is taking over in terms of the main source of exposure. Um, and I guess just another point for PFAS impacted communities. And, you know, fortunately, once water contamination issues are discovered, um, they are usually addressed. Um, but you know, I think another understudied area is sort of what's the legacy of contamination exposures in that community. Are there um, people ask have asked me about backyard produce or you know locally grown foods in an area where the water used to be contaminated, and what's sort of the timeline and the um, geographical footprint of that water contamination in the longer term. Thanks, all of you. Very good. Well, thank you all for your uh, presentations and your comments. I hope that's been useful to the committee. I know it's been uh, certainly enlightening to me to, to hear uh, from those of you who do this every day. So I will turn it back to Ned.